the three things that M really loved doing going to the gym as i've already said she loved that working in the pub because she would absolutely she worked behind the bar i used to go in i do go in there on a thursday night with my, my with my mates a group of dads of a certain age go in there and of all different backgrounds some ex-military some uh, you know have nothing to do with the military just just a load of us and she would be behind the bar and she would absolutely hold court she was one of those girls that could <coughs> absolutely hold court but then she'd come back home and she'd just need three or four hours to chill out on her own because she'd put so much effort into that but she could see work get, you know the pub was going to close and then on the wednesday morning she woke up and she was quite agitated she was very agitated she wanted to go up she was coughing by now and she wanted to go up uh to the coast and stanton take our little doggy for a walk and we said y you can't you're coughing you could you know spread it uh so the rules were at the time mm -hmm. if you're coughing you stay in and your family stays <clears> in <throat> And she was really agitated about this and really upset about it. And she just went outside and slammed the door into our back garden. And when we'd been under, uh, Emma had been under cams before, all the specialists said, if Emma has, ever has a bit of a fit, don't chase her because it could agitate the situation, could aggravate it. Just let her go off, cool down. And that's what we'd done for years. And she would always go, we've got some trees, and she'd always go and just sit in the bottom of the trees. She'd got dens in the trees where her and her uh, brother and sister would, would made dens when they were little and stuff. <coughs> Uh, anyhow, we, we went out about 10 minutes later to try and find her 15 minutes later and we went into, uh, and we couldn't find her and then we, we found her and that was the day our lives changed forever. The, the pressure of being kept in, she tried to take her own life. It was just, our, our world just, uh, uh, there's no words to describe what, it just hell on earth was an east devastation, uh, just was was unleashed uh we got her to hospital i had to yeah we got her to hospital uh that was on the the wednesday and the hospital didn't really know what to do with her what in terms mean? of she went into critical care but because it, it, it was the start of the pandemic no one knew how to te treat she was still alive she was still yeah i managed to kind of get some of her heartbeat back again uh so she was still just about alive we couldn't see her for two days in hospital simply because she went put onto the critical care COVID ward. So in those days, there were two critical care wards. One, if you had got COVID and one, if you hadn't, if you got COVID, then you couldn't have anyone to see you. So it took two days to get a, a diagnosis, you know, has she got COVID or hasn't she? And uh, on the Friday night, we were told, yeah, you can come and see her. She hasn't got COVID. The, the, her cough was a common cold. So she just common cold. It's like, shit we got into hospital and they said there's no chance of her surviving now that's it her brain uh, is she's brain dead we can't see anything or so although her body's alive so there we were looking at our you know baby daughter uh, they told us that she'd signed the organ donation register when she was 12 when she'd started high school they'd obviously had a talk from the organ donation world and we, we then went through the next couple of days the only pinprick of light in this whole mess was the fact that her organs might go and help somebody else. But the whole organ donation process was buggered up at the time simply because all of the experts that normally do the organ donation process were now on the COVID critical care wards. So uh, anaesthetists who would normally administer the anaesthetics were no longer doing <coughs> anaesthetist stuff, they were doing critical care doctor stuff. So it was a real messed up situation, but every time an organ donor was found, they'd come and find us and say, you know, we've got someone for her kidneys or someone for a liver. Uh, so for a heart, it's a biggie. They found a 14 year old girl for a heart, which is like, wow, that's cool. And then uh, on the Sunday, we uh, they got everything lined up. They got the operating theaters. They got all the ambulances. She's still alive at this point. Yeah, she's yeah. still alive. So when they, uh, organ donation process, the staff at the hospital were just so, caring and so lovely and all we're doing is trying to keep her alive to keep the organs in the best condition as possible for so the donors stand as much chance and they don't tell you where the donors live or anything like that they just tell you that we found a donor we found a donor and then they tell you afterwards or they tell you the age and the sex of the the donor and that, that's it so to know that her heart was going to a 14 year old was just like <coughs> brilliant you know that's that's someone's life absolutely transformed and Emma got a good heart, you know, in terms of, <laughs> in more ways than mom, but bless her. She was, you know, massively generous, but fit as well. And then, yeah, on the Sunday, we, we held her as we turned the life support off. 
and just our world just imploded again we you know to to watch your daughter just slip away in front of you 